All right, hello everyone. Welcome to today's training industry leader talk on augmented and virtual reality brought to you by VR Vision, Gronstead Group, and Uptail. I'm Elizabeth Parker, Marketing and Event Manager here at Training Industry. So happy you decided to join us today. Before we dive into our first session on measurable virtual reality training for business, I would like to just quickly review some housekeeping items to help you interact with your speakers and get the most out of your time with us. Throughout today's event, please feel free to chat your comments in the chat window, submit any questions you have for our speakers in the Q&A window, and we'll be uh, monitoring those comments and questions throughout the session, and I'll be holding those questions for the end uh, during our Q&A time. Of course, I encourage you to share the information you receive today with your colleagues and network on social media. Please include our handle training industry, which is just training industry without the Y. We'll be engaging in that Twitter conversation, so uh, please feel free to join in there. At the end of your time with us, you'll notice that a short evaluation survey pops open in your browser. We would greatly welcome your feedback about today's event. And lastly, all of our sessions are being recorded and are, will be archived on trainingindustry.com. You'll receive a follow-up email from us as soon as those uh, sessions are available. If this is your first event with Training Industry, a special welcome goes out to you. Training Industry exists to support the learning leader. We offer timely and insightful information on the business of learning through live events like today's virtual conference, as well as through website and magazine articles, research reports, referral services, and our podcast, uh, which is just to name a few. You can find all of the ways that we connect you with expert perspectives in the industry at trainingindustry.com. And of course, today's event is made possible by our sponsors. So I'd like to take a moment to share this message from VR Vision before we jump into our first session. Hey, I'm Lauren Fade, co-founder and COO here at VR Vision Group. Historically, businesses have struggled with delivering impactful, while at the same time, innovative training solutions. This has been further amplified in 2020 with the current global pandemic and travel restrictions around the world. Our mission at VR Vision is to use virtual reality to help businesses standardize training, reduce costs, and overall improve employee learning outcomes. We help our clients achieve this by creating scalable while at the same time interactive VR simulations. For the first time ever, we can digitally replicate workflows in a hands-on way. This was impossible to achieve otherwise due to safety, complexity, or geographic constraints. With virtual reality training, we are able to gain insights around the employee learning process, as well as identify areas of workflow improvement for optimized learning outcomes. We hope that you can join us to learn more about how VR technology can empower your brand. All right, and without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to your first speaker, Lauren Fade. Lauren is the co-founder and chief operating officer of VR Vision, an immersive technology startup developing virtual and augmented reality training solutions for some of the world's top brands. Lauren is also a published writer for Forbes and entrepreneur.com, as well as an innovative leader of and speaker on immersive technologies. So uh, Lauren, it's a pleasure having you with us today. Without any further ado, I am going to hand control over to you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for that warm introduction. I hope my audio is loud and clear for everybody, and I uh, hope you're all staying safe and you've had the chance to digest your coffee this morning. Um, my name is Lauren Fade. I'm immersive technology startup here at VR Vision. Uh, today, we're going to be taking an in-depth look at virtual reality training and just how businesses can adopt immersive technology, but not only adopt it, but measure it and track results for improved employee learning onboarding, training, and upskilling. Uh, do I have control? Here we go. Uh, so just gonna give you guys a little bit of background about uh, VR Vision. Um, we have been in business for almost five years now, and we are developing enterprise training solutions using a combination of both augmented and virtual reality. Our core focus here has always been to develop scalable, future-proofed enterprise training solutions. 
And we've been going with the world's leading companies like Siemens, GE, Toyota, Iberdola, uh, to name a few, uh, to create training simulations particularly. Um, we are a trusted leader in the space. Uh, we've been providing uh, these solutions with our, our core focus on um, working with groups in the energy, renewables, automotive, and emerging markets. Um, currently, we rank number two in the world uh, right after Google's Next Now, according to Clutch. Uh, they are a third party uh, rating agency that places companies uh, based on competency and client reviews. I'm trying to change slides here, Elizabeth. Can we move uh, a slide ahead? We're a slide behind, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, <clears throat> as I was saying, feel free to look us up uh, on Clutch, uh, to check out our reviews and what our clients are saying. So yeah, let's, uh, let's get to an audience poll question here. Um, I'd like to see by, uh, by the poll, how many of you today have used virtual reality? Um, have you used it regularly? Have you used it once or twice or sad face, <laughs> never tried VR? Uh, be curious to see, you know, just how many people here have had a chance to play around with the technology. Um, even if it was only once or twice at a trade show. We'll give, uh, give, them, give the people a chance to uh, answer. All right, everyone, take one more moment to pop your answer into that poll. Five, four, Thanks, Sarah. three, two, and one. Yep, there you go, Lauren. All right, so uh, we have a, a slim margin here. So most of you guys have tried it only once or twice. 37% only has never tried it, interesting. So, you know, we are still in the early phases of, uh, of adoption for virtual reality technology. And uh, well, th that's a good thing. It means you guys are gonna learn a lot today <laughs> during my talk. <clears throat> Can we go to the, the next slide? <clears throat> All right, there we go, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about adoption. Um, these numbers are from emarketer.com. They did an independent study um, and they found that uh, for the population in the United States particularly, um, Adoption is about one of every five households right now uh, for people that have tried virtual reality. And uh, they found that 15% of people have tried VR or will use VR once a month. So there's only a very small percentage of people that are using it regularly. Uh, that number goes up to 23% for augmented reality usage. And we see those numbers climbing. As you can see, there's a uptrend growth on the charts here. Um, we're estimating that by the end of 2021, uh, there's going to be uh, an uptick in a resurgence in VR usage, uh, predominantly because uh, Facebook and Oculus are launching a new headset in the coming weeks, uh, the Oculus Quest 2, and they're, they're dropping the price point down to $299. So it's going to be a lot more affordable for mass adoption. And we, we think a lot more people are going to be picking one up uh, just to play with or at least have some fun with. <clears throat> Next. So before I dive into my talk, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the philosophy behind learning. And uh, I'm showing here the, the Dale's Cone of Experience, which is a model that incorporates several theories related to instructional design and learning processes. During the 1960s, Edgar Dale theorized that learners retain more information by what they do as opposed to what is heard, read, or observed. And his research led to the development of this cone of experience that we see here in this triangle pyramid form. Uh, today, this is learning by doing, which has been more commonly phrased as experiential learning or experiential development. And as you can see above, uh, at the bottom of this pyramid, we gain that 90% of what we do through experience gets retained. Um, so this means that a VR experience that's simulating a real world experience will have almost, if not the same amount of impact for learning. Uh, carrying on. Uh, so our second poll question, uh, 
How many of you, I, I, I guess this number is going to be a little bit lower because of our first poll question, but how many of you have used VR in a business setting or for training specifically? And I'll give you guys a chance to, to answer that question. Um, obviously, we're going to have 37% uh, uh, unable to answer this because they haven't ad adopted or tried it, but I'm um, curious to see about the rest of you um, if you've had a chance to try it in, in your business or for training. <clears throat> We'll give the audience a, a chance to uh, to weigh in. <clears throat> okay, interesting. So we have, yes, my company has adopted VR for training. Nineteen percent of you. So that is that is really good to see that uh, almost twenty percent of of uh, the people here have had some form of VR usage within their business. Um, and it's, it's also great to see 44% of you have actively been looking. Obviously you're, you're, you're joining this webinar, so there is some interest. 37% um, is actually the exact same number uh, as our first poll. So we're getting a lot of accuracy here <laughs> from trusting these results. All right, carrying on. So, during my talk today, we're going to discuss VR training platforms. Um, can I switch slides here? So I'm having trouble changing the slides, Elizabeth, if you can just move it forward for me. Um, so during the talk today, we're going to be talking about how VR training platforms can effectively measure, uh, can be measured to enhance ROI, uh, improve learning outcomes, and to really quantify those learning outcomes with, with data using VR or even AR technology. We've kind of umbrellaed the term XR uh, that relates to both, but for this talk, we're gonna, we're gonna state core focus on VR. Um, some of the main benefits of, of VR training is that it allows for a better optimized learning outcome and workflow. As we said before, uh, users retain knowledge through doing uh, a lot better than traditional method, methods. So being able to put on a, a VR headset and simulate a work process or workflow um, in a safe and controlled environment will allow replicability of that, that workflow as many times as you want without errors. Um, we'll just accelerate work training completion. And if you're able to train more people faster, uh, you're able to surpass audits while meeting compliance. And we can avoid the classroom altogether uh, which is especially relevant during our global pandemic that we're in currently. Um, another key benefit is that companies can greatly reduce their travel expense and environmental footprint. Uh, you don't have to fly uh, employees all over the country now for, for training programs and seminars when you can just have them work remotely inside of a VR headset. Uh, you're also able to, to ship VR headsets almost anywhere so remote training for employees uh, becomes a breeze. And lastly, one of the, one of the bigger benefits is you, you allow for a saving on space requirements that, uh, that will also help to lower insurance premiums, uh, but also reduce incidence rates during onboarding and upskilling, which is especially important during any type of high risk job type. All right, let's, uh, let's get to another poll question. <clears throat> Well, would your business look to build VR training internally or would you hire a specialized firm? This is a really uh, interesting question. Um, we've, we've seen a lot in the last five years of business working with uh, enterprise groups. Uh, a, lot, a lot of companies do have a, their own internal team. Um, and a lot of the times we work with that internal team to, to build out full scale platforms. So yes, we're looking to build VR internally, no, we looked to outsource a combination of one and two, or for that 37% of you, not sure yet, probably. <clears throat> we'll give everyone a minute to answer while I have a sip of water. <clears throat> okay, some interesting results. So 10% of you are looking to build VR internally, 15% uh, are looking to outsource. 38%, uh, which is what I expected the, the majority to be, is a combination of one and two. And we have the 37%, 38%, not sure yet. 
So it's aligning with our last two questions. Perfect. All right, moving on. <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about uh, the number of key metrics you're able to track when it comes to virtual reality devices, because each of these needs to be considered when you're measuring a learning outcome. Uh, the first is viewpoint and object tracking. So this is where you're looking in a VR simulation, how long you're looking at certain objects, what areas are trackable, the movement of their hands through the virtual world, as well as how they're moving through the virtual world. All this can be tracked um, and recorded so we can have post-training uh, analysis or assessments after. The second type of, of tracking is interactions and object manipulation, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's using hand tracking or the controllers uh, to interact with elements and move and, and manipulate objects in the scene seamlessly. This could be working with a wrench or, or, or some type of mechanics um, where you, you need to use your hands or the controllers. All of this can be tracked to ensure that users in the simulation are learning and uh, gaining something from that. Uh, the third point here is recording UX and UI responses. Similar to the poll that we're seeing here during this webinar, um, in a VR simulation, we can have pop-ups with QAs or multiple choice selections. To, to quiz the user during, during the simulation to enhance the learning outcome and just make it more immersive. And lastly, we have the storyline and pathways. So this is, this is developing a, a set user journey uh, to guide them through a process for learning. Um, and this could, this could be anything like how to perform maintenance on a nuclear reactor or, or how to install uh, a doorknob. <laughs> the sky's the limit. We can pretty much recreate any type of physical process in VR. Uh, and that's, that's what makes it uh, a, a beautiful thing. <laughs> Moving on. So uh, how do we get the most out of a VR training program? Um, firstly, we wanna make our, our VR simulations as immersive and as interactive as possible. The more uh, the user in the simulation feels that they're interacting with a live environment, the more impactful the more memorable the experience will be. And this is especially important for any hard skill based training where you require a copy of the real world interaction or process. A lot of the times a copy to a, a finite detail. Um, so one of the key things here is user login and LMS integration. Um, this will allow user data to be stored on the cloud and analyzed later. Um, this is especially necessary to accurately measure results from training on, on, a, on scale, especially for organization-wide um, learning for larger groups of employees. Uh, we, we integrate with either SCORM or XAPI for uh, a lot of the newer software to date. And this allows the VR program to interact with a data layer on the back end and just store information for, for post-learning assessments. Uh, another key point to get the most out of VR training is adding narration um, so that the user can have like a, a piggyback on their shoulder guiding them through the, the immersive simulation. And this will allow them to explore the virtual environment seamlessly and be guided so that they, they know where to go. Because um, a lot of the times when people are trying VR, it may be their first time. They may not know how to use the controllers. They may not know where to interact with objects. So having kind of like the paperclip in Microsoft Word um, in your back pocket giving you advice will really help the overall learning outcome. Uh, another key point here is hotspots and overlays. Um, this is very similar to the guide. It's, it's going to, you'll see it in a, the example video that we show in a bit, uh, but it's basically highlighting objects that you want the user to engage with uh, to really help, help aid them so they're not lost in, in the immersive simulation. And lastly, uh, another key point here is 360 interactive video is uh, one of the forms of VR simulations. And the other side of the coin is CG-based simulations. 360 video uh, is much better suited for soft skill training, like customer service or health and safety, or, or even troubling conversations for hiring and onboarding training. Whereas CG-based simulations, kind of like video game style graphics, uh, are much better suited for hard skill training. This is where 
you need to do any type of task or process based work. Uh, examples could be construction, machinery operation, uh, maintenance and repair work, electrical work, anything where you're engaging with objects and interacting with objects. <clears throat> So let's talk about measuring the results of VR training programs. We have a quote from Eric Bin Jolson that says, the heart of science is measurement. And data collection leads to learning assumptions and overall this will help optimize the learning process. So measuring the results is key with individual training system sessions, but also company-wide so that you can benchmark and, and leverage the information to see where there's gaps and where you can improve. Uh, comparing training modules to each other in order to gauge and measure employee competency and understanding which are more effective is also very important. Uh, in the screenshots here, we have a user login at the, the top right, which is enable, enablement for unique users to log in to track the individual results. And then the bottom picture here, we have uh, six training modules for different machines for one of our clients. Um, and this allowed them to compare training outcomes for different machines to see which ones um, their employees were having trouble learning on and which ones were, they weren't. Overall, it allows you to measure employee performance post VR training. So once you take the headset off, you can look at the data and quantify ROI, as well as impact from those training scenarios, which is more, more important than we think. <clears throat> Another consideration um, when adopting VR training programs is device management. Um, if you're part of a larger organization, uh, you'll have multiple devices that could be all over the world, global. Um, and we partnered with Oculus uh, by Facebook because they have a seamless platform that makes it easy for integration. Um, Oculus for Business is their backend management platform, and it allows an IT professional uh, to basically have an overview of all the headsets on the network, where they can push updates, see the status, see the location of it um, and effectively manage remotely all the devices on the network. <clears throat> all right, let's 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 get into some fun stuff. So our, sorry, I think I went too far here. Our first um, case study is with Toyota Motors. Um, I'm gonna play the video here and let it play out while I explain what you're seeing. Um, so this was done for uh, their ad hazard identification training. And one of the challenges they had was they had limited space and limited trainer resources. So we made a 360 interactive video simulation for them to reduce the time to train on hazard identification. Um, so this is just one of dozens of modules we've created for them. Um, but we basically recreated a mock playthrough scene and the user is tasked with looking through the scene as it's playing and identifying hazards that are all around the scene that have been some hidden and some obvious. And they had a lot of success with this rollout. They were able to train up to 20,000 frontline workers seamlessly. Uh, they were able to reduce their training space from 3,000 square feet to 500 square feet, um, and even less now because uh, they're training remotely due to COVID. Uh, they were able to reduce their orientation time. And I think this is the biggest takeaway from this case study. Um, from eight hours of, of training for onboarding to just 30 minutes using VR. And the cost savings, uh, we don't have specific measurable ROI on yet, but we will um, in about six months time for a, for a future case study, because th those metrics are gonna be interesting to see as well. But overall, the time uh, health and safety team members spent with on-site onboarding for hazard identification training was reduced by 80%. Um, and, and that alone was a huge takeaway for them. Um, we basically tracked every time the user was logged in and played through a module, as well as the results of the module. So over time, we started to see patterns emerge as to which training outcomes were being missed the most. Uh, so Toyota was able to do, to do where they needed to improve the, the areas of training the most. Um, so at the end of this uh, video, we have, I'm just going to skip to the end, uh, a results screen for the user, which brings up all the hazards from the module, as well as which ones they missed and, and which ones they found. Uh, some of the hazards were a little bit difficult to find because they would only appear for two to three seconds. 
So if the user wasn't quick enough to identify it, they would have missed it. And, and then they were able to recap the results at the end here so they can see which ones they missed, uh, which ones were more hazardous than others. Um, so they can have a benchmark for, for gaps in, in the training. Definitely a very, very powerful training method. So this is um, interactive 360 video. Um, I'm going to take, we're going to move to the next case study here, which is the other side of the coin, which is uh, CG based uh, development or simulation based virtual reality. We call it 3D interactive simulations. Uh, so this case study was with the uh, Avon Grid or Iberdola Group. Um, can we full screen this? I, I'm not sure double clicking is working. <clears throat> Yes, there'll be a, a downloaded uh, recording of this presentation, Jeffrey. Um, perfect, thank you, Elizabeth. So th this, uh, this is a more full scale training uh, simulation that we developed for wind turbine technician training. So we worked with Avon Grid. Uh, some of the challenges were how do they eliminate risk from hazardous training environments? As you can imagine, training on, uh, on a wind turbine 100 feet in the air, or sometimes way higher than that, 300 feet in the air, uh, can be a little bit dangerous, uh, a little bit hazardous. Um, in this aspect, the, the user was put in this virtual world, which uh, was an exact replica of the real world scenario environment. So what they're seeing here, uh, this is a user login and scatter screen. Um, they have to go and put on their PPEs. You can see the user is looking at his watch right here. Um, and this is kind of like his guide throughout the simulation, giving him the next steps of, of where to progress. And at the start of the, the learning simulation, we kept it really simple for the end user because we, we know that not everyone has used VR before. So we wanted to really ease them into the controller function, um, how to use the joystick, how to use the trigger, so it starts out really simple. And then as they progress and learn how to pick up the controls, uh, it gets more complex. So the user uh, runs through the training scenario. It's 100% risk-free without incidents or danger that would apply in the real world. Um, this also allowed for unlimited replayability, which is extremely beneficial for obvious reasons. And with Avangrid, we developed the wind turbine repair simulation that their technicians could replay and learn from anywhere in the world uh, without the need for vast travel expenses far and wide uh, to learn on actual turbines. So some of the takeaways um, and results from this simulation were um, they had a net, net zero incident rate. So they've eliminated on-site safety uh, incidents altogether. Um, they've saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions in annual savings due to reduced OEM reliance and eliminated travel costs, not including incident rates from on the job accidents or faulty repairs. And the training effectiveness was increased uh, by 65%. So they were able to train new technicians and onboard, uh, onboard new technicians up to 65% faster than they were able to before. So this was, a, this was a, one of our, our better case studies to date. That's why we included it. Um, Oculus is publishing uh, a PDF format of this case study in the next week or so. Um, so if you're, if you're inclined, uh, visit the Oculus for Business website and you should see our case study published there uh, in the next couple of weeks. So the user goes outside, he inspects the turbine. A lot of people uh, were missing this uh, step in the training process. So we, we made it uh, clear for them. And then the user goes into the turbine uh, to perform a, a full maintenance simulation. Uh, this video is only four minutes long. There is a much longer one that shows the user going up and performing uh, oil leak maintenance. Um, but for the sake of this webinar, we were only showing a short form of this demo. So here they're performing a lockout tagout procedure. Uh, you can see the, the button is highlighted there. It's flashing white. So is the key right now. So the highlights are really guiding them through the simulation to show them what step is next in the learning process. Um, this, this can be turned off. So once they've gone through the simulation, maybe once or twice, and they feel like they've learned the process, they can turn off the guide 
and rerun through the entire simulation to test themselves and see if they're learning uh, the exact steps of the process. And I think that brings us to our last poll question. Does your company have a, a job or process that could benefit from virtual reality training scenarios? I'll give you guys a minute to answer while I have a sip of water. <laughs> I think virtual reality is especially beneficial for any type of job or, or task that has an element of danger to it. So if, if, you're, if you're obviously working on, let's say a nuclear reactor performing uh, repair or maintenance, uh, you know, you'd rather work on a virtual environment than make a mistake in, in the real world. Um, this could be exactly true for construction sites as well. Any type of any type of high risk job um, would have really tremendous merits uh, for for using virtual reality simulations. Um, so yeah, that that actually brings us to the end of my presentation. Um, we'll open it up for a, a live Q A with the audience. Uh, I'm sure you guys may have some burning questions. Uh, I have my business partner, Ronnie, here to join me to, to help answer any of the questions that you guys may have. I hope you found this presentation insightful and informative. And uh, my contact details are here. Feel free to add me uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, or shoot me an email. Uh, you can also visit us on the web, vrvisiongroup.com, or connect with us on social media. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Lauren, for that great presentation. Uh, everyone, if you have questions, go ahead and pop open your Q&A panel, start typing those in. Now we'll get through as many of them as we can. I um, wanted to start off with one of these questions in the Q&A panel. Um, this was from Agnieszka, who wanted to know, how does VR integration happen with an LMS? Can you provide a brief overview of what is required? So I'll let Lauren take a breather now. Thanks for the presentation, oh. Lauren. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, Thanks everyone. Absolutely. I've been answering some of the questions on the back end mm -hmm. uh, while, while chatting, but uh, it's a good question. So the way we do that is there's two ways of integration uh, with, with the LMSs, and it comes down to the LMS that you're using. Typically, most modern ones are using XAPI, and through that, we connect to an LRS, and then with that, we're able to push all the information, all the data that we're tracking, uh, back to the LMS. And we're currently working with SCORM to make our um, application SCORM compliant as well. That's still a work in progress, but I'd, I'd say within this quarter, it should all be completed. And that's how we uh, usually integrate with uh, LMSs. Amazing. Uh, moving right along, here's a question from Anne who wanted to know, can this be used for human skills, otherwise known as soft skills for things like leadership and communication development? So the answer to that is yes, but what we have found in our experience is that it is typically more tailored towards kind of like more hard skill training. Uh, you can do soft skills in terms of empathy building, but the challenge with VR right now, especially for delivering cost-effective and timely solutions, is that the interaction that you need for communication uh, skill building requires a little bit of back and forth, and the AI and the systems aren't quite there to deliver that yet. Um, thanks, Ronnie. Uh, all right, here's a question it says, can you address how XR supports learners with disabilities, specifically users with visual, auditory, or cognitive disabilities? It's another really good question. Uh, so one of the things we look to is there is a limitation with users that have a visual impairment uh, because it is very much a visual first type of training experience. But for people with auditory and other cognitive ability uh, limitations, the way we've done it is we've included some traditional things like uh, voiceovers and uh, text pop-ups and visual kind of like prompts, uh, as well as physical uh, feedback such as controller vibrations, et cetera. So we try to include as many uh, feedback uh, points, whether they're visual, auditory, or sometimes just outright physical to address some of those. But if somebody can't see very well, uh, they may actually, that, that'll go into NOSHA and other issues. So we try, that might be a challenge and that's something we typically try to avoid. 
Another, um, just to follow up on Ronnie's saying there, uh, we also developed a tablet mobile control app. So a third party practitioner um, a lot of times can control what the user is seeing in a VR simulation and control the simulation for them if they don't have full motor function or capabilities. Um, and we've done that in the healthcare sector yes. and in the long-term long -term care sector uh, quite a bit. Awesome, thanks. Thanks, Lauren and Ronnie. Um, kind of combining two questions from Roman and Tatiana, uh, what are the limitations in using VR and what do you think is the main barrier for widespread adoption? Uh, I'd say there isn't one. There, there's a few barriers for widespread adoption. I think the biggest uh, takeaway we can present is that focusing it around the right use cases. Uh, and that's how you get the most return for this from our clients. So using VR, as you would, let's say, traditional web-based training or manual and PDF is not going to work. It's, it's sort of like more like a scalpel than a sledgehammer as a tool goes. So focusing it around specific use cases, I think it's still going to make it relatively niche for the next few years because it is relatively costly to create experiences for and it does take some time. Uh, so that's the one. And the second, I'd say the biggest reason is because the technology is so early stage, you don't find out of the box solutions very often as you would with existing software. I mean, we have Zoom, it exists. Nobody had to build Zoom for us for this conference. As the technology matures and these applications become more and more turnkey and they become more and more out of the box, you'll see more and more adoption. So that's another challenge with the technology being so early stage. Mm. Perfect, thanks, Ronnie. All right, um, some questions about you know how it how the processes of building a VR experience, um, how long does it take and what types of information or material would um, someone need to provide to develop something like this? Um, yeah, so for, you wanna take that one? I'll take that, I'll, I'll let you take a break, don't worry. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, so it, 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 it is a difficult question to answer because it varies. It varies. Uh, but I can I can sort of like give you a guide and, and break it down into two portions. So one is through the creation of interactive real world 3D videos. And the typical timeline for that is about two to three weeks per module. That's about five minutes long. Um, that's the time to deliver that type of solution. And the cost would vary anything from ten fifteen thousand dollars on the low end all the way to 30 plus. And the reason for that variation in cost come, comes down to interactions. The more interactions the user gets to do while they're being trained and the more they interact with the scene, the higher the cost and usually the longer the timeline to deliver. While the second one is more around the CG graphics. So let's say the answer, my first question was more like Toyota, what you saw there. The second one is more like Avangrid and that's more CG based. And these solutions typically take about double the amount of time and sometimes even cost to what you would typically deliver with interactive 360 video. Perfect, thanks, Ronnie. Um, let's see, here is a question from Laura. She wanted to know, you know, if, she's, if they're just entering into the market, what advice would you give in um, someone who's just starting up or just considering uh, VR use? Uh, it's a good question. I'd say the first thing to do is VR has become a little bit less cost prohibitive, just buying a consumer uh, Oculus Quest. The Oculus Quest 2 has just come out. Try it out on a, on a consumer level, I would say, and then reach out to vendors like us and others that will be presenting here. Ask them for demos and ask us for demos and we can provide these applications to you. And then you can get hands on with some of the things that we're presenting. And that'll give you a very good idea around whether this is a good fit for your organization or not, if you try it out yourself. Because one of the things you notice in the presentation is it may look disorienting because you're seeing somebody else's point of view. Uh, but if you're using the hardware yourself, then you get a very different perspective to how it works. Awesome, thanks, Ronnie. Um, how about this question from Iftekar, who says, how is the social acceptance of AR VR by learners? Um, have you seen any challenges in the adoption of, of it on the learner side? Early days, yes. Uh, but that was, frankly, a limitation on what the software developers, including ourselves, were delivering at that time. But as the applications became more sophisticated, the user experience became smoother and better. We've seen less and less. So some of that, you know, for example, like the early days when people were trying the Samsung gears or they were wearing headsets with mobile phones, people were getting dizzy. The experience wasn't that good. 
but there was a limitation on the hardware and the software delivered. So back then, like three, four, five years ago, we saw a lot more uh, challenges and obstacles. Today, adoption has been a lot better and there's been much more, less issues and concerns because people enjoy it more and it works better. Awesome. Well, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, here's one from Tony who wanted to know, have you considered working with the mining industry? Uh -huh. um, well, we, we have, we were in Toronto base. There's a lot of mining companies here. Uh, we, we have some pilot projects on the go. Uh, we think there's definitely some really good use cases in mining just because of the, the whole risk factor and the fact that a lot of the mines are remote, right? So it's very difficult to get uh, training for some of these people, plus safety, of course. Yeah, we, we have a few um, conversations actively pursuing with gold fields um, right now out of South Africa. Uh, there is a lot of interest for safety training, particularly. Perfect. Uh, thanks so much, Lauren, for your presentation. Uh, Rani, thanks for joining us and helping answer uh, these questions. There's still plenty um, open here. So everyone, I'd, I'd certainly encourage you to check out VR Vision and, and direct your questions to them afterwards if we weren't able to answer them. Definitely a pleasure. Thanks for having me, uh, Training History, Elizabeth, Sarah. Uh, it was a pleasure and I'm, I hope everyone found uh, my presentation informative. Yes. Feel free to reach out. Thank you to all the attendees. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer some of this if this is still open <laughs> in the meantime. Uh, so thanks everyone. Perfect. Thanks so much. All right. Um, up next, uh, we will be hearing from Andres Gronstead about virtual reality simulations and mobile games for the post-pandemic era. So Anders, if you are with us, go ahead, unmute yourself. Tell us hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Hi excited there. to be talking to you. <laughs> So we're looking forward to your session, um, which will start in just about 15 minutes, everyone. So you have a little bit of time for a quick break and we'll meet you back here shortly. <laughs> 